think the, the extended nature of the series is a help or a hindrance for England? Obviously it gives them more time to sort of acclimatise to conditions, but at the same time it's a more thorough examination. Well, it's a more thorough examination and also the tests are close together. And, uh, you know, once you get on the wrong end of Indian test players and a, a result or two against you, it's really hard to come back because there's no time to recover, there's no time for anybody else to get into form, for instance, if the batsmen are struggling. What do you do? I mean, England did incredibly well in that series in 2012 because they, they lost the first test in Ahmedabad handsomely, you know, and suddenly they managed to come back and, and win the next two. So you, you've got to get some kind of momentum going and if people suddenly start to struggle, it's very hard to come back from that. But while England might have their work cut out, in terms of format, with the test coming first and then there's the break, they're going home for Christmas and New Year before the ODIs, do you think that helps to make the tour a less daunting prospect with that break in between? Do you think that, that works in their favour in any way? Well, I, I don't like to use the word daunting anyway, because obviously it'd be a tough assignment on the pitch, but I think the key to going to India and playing cricket in India, whether it's five tests or one day series, is, is enjoying it, actually, and, and sort of embracing it and really to engaging with it and you know the passion that, that people have for cricket in in India throughout especially in fact in fact in the smaller towns they've got two tests in, in quite you know small very sort of unusual venues Rajkot Rajkot and Vishkapatnam which mm -hmm. is on the sea you know which is a sort of probably it's not quite like going to Ibiza obviously <laughs> it's their version of Blackpool it, it sort of is yeah <laughs> it, it's like a kind of a a slightly old-fashioned seaside resort. Mm. I think you can you can enjoy that. It's it's the one place you go as a cricket player where you you feel like a a rock star or a Premier League football player. Everybody knows who you are. Every, people know your stats better than you do. <laughs> um, you know, cricket is without any question the religion down there. Um, and you know, you you'd be foolish to kind of to look at it in any other way than it being a, a great experience for you, whether you played brilliantly or otherwise. Um, fabulous tour. I wish I'd done it more than once. Well, so much is made of the difficulties of touring India and the subcontinent. What are your uh, what are your top tips for surviving the subcontinent? Well, I think uh, actually it's it's quite simple. Uh, the food now in India is is so good, in the hotels and in many restaurants as well. And and so I think you go local is my first rule. Uh, you eat the Indian food. Uh, as much as you can. Obviously, if you're playing the next day, it's probably not the best thing to have the hottest curry. But I think, you know, curry of some kind, which they cook very well, they know exactly what they're doing, uh, I think is, is a good rule. Uh, plenty of yogurt, which kind of not only cools the curry down, but it's just good for digestion. And the, the one real secret that I found from probably 20 visits to India, both as a player and, and as a journalist, is papaya. <laughs> um, poor Paul here, uh, known as as well. Uh, it's very, very good for digestion, and I have it every day. And I've never been ill in India, except once in 1980, my first trip. I've been clean bill of health. So I'm hoping that the combination of papaya, yogurt, and decent curries is is the right route to go. Well, there you go, the Simon Hughes secret to surviving the subcontinent. Survival tip. I remember that story Bear about eat your heart out. The story about Matthew Hoggard when he used to go and go on imaginary dog walks just to sort of clear his mind. Did you, do you have any stories of players you used to tour with? Well, how they I mean, we, we toured in, my only tour as a player there was 2001. So um, we were kind of under house arrest virtually for that. It was just after the 9-11 um, the attacks. So we couldn't really go anywhere without, without giving 24 hours notice. So it wasn't a great deal of kind of wandering outside of your hotel for a walk to clear your head on that particular tour. Um, but I've, you know, I've been back there many times since, covering the IPL or whatever, and I, and I absolutely love it. Um, you know, the, the only thing I would say is, totally agree with Simon. Eat local, um, drink an enormous quantity of water, and um, no beer, drink scotch. That's it. <laughs> what's, the, what's the value of that? Knocks you out after, gives you a good night's beer, sleep. Uh, beer makes you sick. Yeah. A lot's been made of England's lack of quality spin bowling options, but surely in that attack of Anderson Broad, the emergence of Wokes, Finn had a good tour last mm. time to India. Surely they've got enough guile in there in terms of exploiting <laughs> those, those swinging conditions well, to, to all stay competitive. I, all I'll say to you about that is when England won in India last time, it was on the back of huge amounts of runs at a cook-like tempo from Alistair Cook. 
extraordinary innings from uh, Kevin Peterson, who batted at a tempo that nobody else on either side was able to match. And Swan and uh, Monty Panesar yeah. bowling magnificently. Yes, Anderson, and Anderson in particular did a very, very fine job with the seam bowling, but the problem for your seam bowlers is, yes, they might be able to nip out the odd couple of wickets here and there, but if you're talking about playing in 35 degree heat with 95% humidity, there's only so much damage that they can do at any time, no matter what the conditions are like. So your spin bowlers need to be a cutting edge for you, and they need also to be able to provide control for your captain. And there's one thing that Rashid and Moen Ali weren't able to do on the trip to uh, to the UAE, where they lost to Pakistan, would provide any sort of control for them whatsoever when the pitch wasn't turning massively, and then they weren't confident enough to land enough balls when the ball was turning square. Massive problem for England, that. Huge, huge problem, which is why they've taken an old hand like Gareth Batty on the trip. Now, this is a ball here that you'd get 40 overs old in England, uh, where it's got plenty of polish, you've got a nice proud seam, you can still make this ball move around, and Anderson would be good with this ball in English conditions, but you don't get a ball like that in either Bangladesh or India. It tends to be more like this after 30 or 40 overs. Very flat it's like seam. Like a dog's had it. Like a dog's had it, exactly. <laughs> the flat seam, so it's not going to move off the pitch. And very dry and scuffed up on one side. Now, this ball will start to reverse swing. In other words, it will start to go in the opposite direction to a conventional swing ball. And where England were very good in that last series in India in 2012 was in Calcutta in particular. Anderson and Finn exploited reverse swings superbly, and that actually was the, the crucial thing that won that test match. And I think that has to be England's plan B, because they haven't got the spin to necessarily exploit those dry conditions. Two venues, Mahali and Mumbai, those test matches come back to back, third and fourth, um, are two places where England seam bowlers might well have a say. Mumbai, the ball bounces and carries through, and you can get some natural swing there, as well as the reverse that we're bound to see at all venues. Um, and Mahali, they can, they can be green, the pitches up there. Um, so those are two places where the conditions might just help England seem a uh, strong attack. But everywhere else, it's going to be spin all the way. Mike, you toured in India in 2001 with England, a three test series, two 50s and a 90. How did, how did you approach, obviously you played Kumble, Harbhajan Singh, yeah. a strong bowling attack, how did you approach the um, I, I had to work incredibly hard for all of those runs. Playing against spin was not, not something that I was renowned for, um, and so it was, so it was a, a, a real test. On this trip, you're, you're batting in a cap most of the time because you knew you, it was going to be spin, spin and more spin. So you had to develop different areas to score in. Um, for that particular trip, I remember sort of working on three different types of sweep shot. None of them reverse because we didn't do that back in those days. <laughs> um, but, you know, to be, able to, to be able to just simply get yourself off strike or maybe put a bit of extra pressure on the spinners when they were, when they were building some up on you. Um, you know, and just being generally quick on your feet. Uh, that, those were the challenges. And the other, I mean, the other thing, Nasser Hussain was captain at the time, and he'd, he'd won two series on the subcontinent in recent times. They beat Pakistan away and they beat Sri Lanka away. And the thing that he always impressed upon the team and on the batting lineup was that don't worry if the game appears to be crawling along at, at no sort of speed. Because in the back end of the game, maybe in the last day or the last half a day, things can happen unbelievably quickly. So your job really as a batsman is to keep the team in the game, keep them moving forward, try not to lose clusters of wickets because you can lose a game in, in, a, in a half an hour period on the subcontinent. So be incredibly patient. It was good advice. Um, we, lost, we lost the series 1-0 having batted appallingly on, on the most English wicket you'll ever play on down in the India in the first test match. That was at Mahali. Uh, and then we played really well on the, on the two turners, two subcontinental turners at, uh, at Bangalore and, and the other one escapes me, but they were both drawn matches and we didn't give, we didn't give a bad account of ourselves given that we were, were massively underdogs on that trip. I think, um, you know, watching from afar, <clears throat> there's no doubt that bat batting gets easier the more you just stay in, yeah. in the subcontinent, especially. You know, in England, you know, you get a loose ball, you can put it away for four straight away. But somehow in India, early on, you come in against spin, you've got four men around the bat, you feel very claustrophobic, you don't know where a run's coming from. But if you can sort of get through those first 25 balls somehow and, and pick up a couple of singles, then sort of it starts to get easier. And the key to it is, is two things, really. And what, what really sort of shone 
uh, out of uh, Alistair Cook's batting in the last series in India was firstly his judgment of length. They got right forward, got down the wicket, smothered the spin, or got right back. He very rarely got caught sort of half and half. And the second thing was manipulating the field. They've only got nine fielders. It's not like 15 fielders. So you can actually find gaps, work <laughs> balls into gaps one fun, side, then. and make, make them move over. And then you've got gaps on the other side, or as Mark says also, talking about sweeps. You know, you can part, find sweep one, and they've got to move a man from mid-wicket to short fine leg, then you've got a gap at mid-wicket to exploit. So, you know, if you kind of almost take it bit by bit, rather than looking at the big picture, just sort of over by over, run by run, and, and actually, you know, things can fall into place. Makes it sound so easy, doesn't it? I wish it was. Well, it is. It's very simple. But you've got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Easier to say it than it is to do it. Obviously, India have undergone a huge amount of changes. You know, since since four years ago in India, they've lost the likes of Sehwag, Tendulkar, MS Dhoni, now moved on, and Kumble, a new coach. I mean, what sort of proposition are they? Of course, I think I'm right in saying they've won 11 of their last 12 home tests, yeah. and the other one was a rain affected draw. I mean, they're still quite the proposition. <laughs> I mean, they're ahead of the proposition. That one of the things they do is that they bat a long way down. Someone like Ashwin has scored test hundreds, comes in at eight. They've got uh, Rohit Sharma fantastic stroke player who scored double hundreds in one day cricket, batting at six and seven. So, you know, they've got, I think they've got more depth in their team. Their opening pair uh, hasn't really cemented itself yet. They've tried a few different combinations. I think that's an area that England could focus on because they've got a new guy now opening the batting alongside Murali Vijay. Uh, Darwin seems to be out of the picture at the moment. I mean, he may come back. So. That's actually an area that England can always focus on because, funnily enough, India have never had, really, a top-class pair of opening batsmen. They've had Sunil Gavaska and they've had Raul Dravid and they've had Sehwag, but they've never had two people who you'd say, you know, I'm, they've, not, they've not ever had a Greenwich or a Haynes mm. so, you know, together. So I think that's an area that England can really focus on. I, I would say the, the key difference between India in 2012 and India now is that now they have a captain who's interested in winning test matches. MS Dhoni was very, he, he at times seemed like he was bored in, in the field with test cricket. He would let games drift. He was not particularly proactive, not particularly aggressive. Virat Kohli will not let things settle for more than three or four overs if he doesn't feel as though his bowlers are in charge and looking to take wickets. He will set games up with aggressive batting or declarations. They're a damn sight more um, they're more like their captain. I mean, it's only very, very laid back, very, very calm, very understated. Virat Kohli is the total opposite of that. He is aggressive. He's desperate to win, um, and he's desperately, desperately sort of keen to show that India are a world force again in Test match cricket. So, under those circumstances, for me, that's the biggest difference. England will not be allowed to kind of get away with patting the ball around for a session or get away with um, bowling tightly for a session at this Indian team. They will come at England a lot more. England's win in 2012, and, and I don't think you can overstate this, was in many ways a bigger achievement than them winning the Ashes down under in 10-11. Of course, no, I agree with you. We'd yeah. had, you know, it'd been all those years, 20, 26 years, 27 years since England had won in Australia. However, to win in India, in a four-match series, in those conditions for an English team was an absolutely staggering achievement. So if England happened to fall short this time round in what is going to be very, very tough um, against a team who are going to be ultra motivated to, uh, to take back the trophy, um, then we shouldn't be overly critical of them on, under those circumstances. An experienced team, yes, there are some fine players, some England great players in that side, but, uh, but winning on the subcontinent for anybody is very, very difficult and it's proven to be too much for successive touring sides, very, very good sides, South Africa, Australia, have all fallen very, very much short on their recent Indian tours. Um, what you would hope from an England side is, and what we've seen from them often in the last four or five years, is that often they will confound the, the critics, confound what you think is going to happen, and they might pull out a win from somewhere and give themselves a shot in the series. It looks highly unlikely, looking at it from this distance, but they find a way somehow, even when you, when you would back everything against them doing so.